2 Samuel chapter number 9, And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not any... Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Meshir, the, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. Then king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Meshir, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David. He fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, Behold, thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant? that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am. Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread alway at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. Mephibosheth didn't do anything to earn the kindness that was shown him. Peepaw, Saul, he didn't really deserve for anybody to show kindness. But Jonathan. Jonathan had shown David Amazing kindness. And David was very thankful. Would to God that we would recognize those that have shown kindness in our lives and or we should be the people who show kindness to others. Father, we love you. Please bless this short message in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Quite a history with David as he first enters into the kingdom uh, to go to work for Saul, he, he becomes just a captain immediately. I mean, just right in there with the military. He had gone from keeping sheep for his uh, father, and, and, and he came in just to bring some cheese and bread to the boys that they were there fighting, and he wanted to encourage them. He showed up, of course. You know the story of uh, David and Goliath and how that the army was there, and they were set in array, but they, they would not fight. And in fact, every time the champion of the Philistines came out, uh, they would hide themselves. And, and, and it was really pitiful. It was embarrassing is what it was. And uh, David shows up and he's like, why is everybody hiding? What's the big deal about this guy? And, and they, they go on to tell about how, how tough he is and how mean and bad he is. And, and, uh, and David hears that the king will give his daughter to, to, to the uh, fellow that will kill him. And David's like, well, let's just go out and kill him. And nobody wants to. The people couldn't believe it. And David kept talking. And of course, his bro oldest brother comes and, and, and really berates him and tries to embarrass him in front of everybody and says, I know thy heart and thy naughtiness. And said, you just came out to see a fight. And, and true, he did. He was coming to see the fight. Problem was, nobody was fighting. Sometimes I think that young people around here uh, looking for people to stand up and be in the battle for the Lord. What a shame if they don't find us fighting. Hey, we show up for church and, oh man, we put on our church costume. Oh, yeah. 
want to be like Jesus, don't we? I'm not sure if Jesus wore the half Windsor or the full Windsor, but we put on our Jesus costume. We come to church, and hey, we're in church, and, and we go to church services, and all of a sudden, you know, man, we, we've got on the outfit. We, we're setting right. We've got that King James Bible, and we're ready to go, but to what end? You got dressed up. You carried your Bible. You dusted it off and brought it to church. You heard the message. You might even amen. And then we left out and was like, oh, that was a good message. Or, man, the preacher needs to shut up. And whatever wherever it was, you had some motivation. Some response happened. And then, then you leave out and all of a sudden our children watch and we don't do anything. Yeah. We don't battle the bad guys. We don't bind the strong man. We don't, we don't, hey, we don't take a long shot. We don't pick up five smooth stones and, and go to battle. Every time the battle comes to us, we run and hide. We're no different than the army of Israel in this case. And that's a shame. Because our children are watching. I don't have any kids. All right, my kids are watching. Somebody else's kids are watching. Our kids need to see us being faithful. Our kids need to see you being faithful. Your kids need to see me being faithful. Hey, our children, all of our children collectively need to see the grown-ups setting the way. By the way, the young children need to see the teenagers and the older kids acting right. They, they need to see us out. They need to know that we're getting something done. And, and you know, they, we, they need to see us taking a stand for our faith. Here, David just says, David started it. He didn't, they didn't say, hey, you know what, boss, uh, a king, live forever. This and there's a, down in Lodabar, man, we're hearing a real sad story about, about Jonathan's son. You remember Jonathan, don't you? Oh, yeah, I remember Jonathan. You know, his son's falling on hard times. He's lame on both his legs and. Wasn't even his fault, you know. Hey, when the battle was coming and, and his, his, his nurse picked him up and she tried to run off with him to get him to safety, she tripped and fell on top of him and crippled him up. Man, he's crippled. It's not good. You know what, king? What would be nice, king, is that maybe you could, you know, start a program, start a ministry, start a, start a, a charity for him, you know. We'll start the ADA. Americans with Disabilities Act. Well, we'll start, we'll make it, you know, because listen, he's down there in Lodabar and he, he's in a wheelchair and, and, and he can't get inside any of the stores and that, all the doors aren't big enough and he can't get down the aisles in the grocery market, you know, and he don't have no money when he gets there. What are we going to do, King? See, that's not the conversation that happened. The conversation that happened is King David, he's there in his heart. He's personally motivated. And he said, is there anybody of the house of Saul that I could show kindness to? Somebody says, one of his old servants, Zeba's here. Then he come in, and I just love the, the Bible is just so plain. You know, he comes in and says, art thou Zeba? Well, they already said, go get Zeba. So the guy who shows up, he's going to be Zeba. And he says, art thou Zeba? I am, Lord. You know, he says, yes, here. Of course, you go in before the king, it's like going in before a judge. Have you, ever, have you ever had to go pay a ticket or anything and you're sitting there and looking around like, when they call your name, call your name, you better raise your hand and say, you know, the bailiff tells you what to do. And they're all like, city of Dallas versus David Grice, you know, you're like, here. And you hope it's just one. I was there one time on three at once. That was horrible. City of Dallas versus David Grice, Here. City of Irving versus David Grice, here. State of Texas, it was a highway patrol. State of Texas versus David Grice, here. The judge is like, we know you're here, Mr. Grice, thank you. <laughs> you know what I'm thankful for? I'm thankful for deferred adjudication. <laughs> if you can just be good, man, that'll work with you on things. Listen, don't, don't, don't mess up. Anyway. They, uh, confession, it's just good for the soul. <laughs> it's a long time ago. David said, I want to show kindness to somebody. And they said, well, Zeba knows. Zeba, Zeba would know. He said, art thou Zeba? He said, I'm Zeba all the way. I'm here, your honor, sir, king, live forever. And, he, and, and, and Zeba, he knew. He said, you know what? Saul's grandson, Jonathan's boy. Sad story, king. Lame on both his feet. Got crippled up. He's there. He said, well, go fetch him. 
Where's he at? He said, down in Lodabar. Go fetch him. He comes in. They, they bring him in. He can't walk. They bring him in. He falls down before the king. And he's just like, I don't even know why I'm here. This can't be good. This king could be evil and mad about all the things my grandpa did. He said, who am I? Man, when, when you look at the wording there, he, in verse 8 he says, And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? That's not a lot of self-esteem. That's some pretty serious humility. And David, he says, Ziva, Ziba's been out of work since Saul hadn't been the king. He's just been hanging around here doing some stuff. But Hey, Ziba, come here. Here's what we're going to do. You see Mephibosheth here? And I like it that when Mephibosheth asked the king there in verse 8, he says, he, he, when he asked him, he says, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? The king didn't say anything. He, doesn't even, he just ignores him. He's like, yeah. Anyway, Ziba. And he just immediately starts talking to Ziba again. And he said that the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertaineth to Saul. All the land, everything's his again. Hey, that's some land, y'all. He was the king. And he said, that's Mephibosheth. And he said, and hey, Ziba, I noticed you've had a little free time on your hand since the regime change. So I'll tell you what we're going to do. You're going to work that land. You and your kids and the others, hey, that's what we're going to do. All your servants are now his servants. And, and listen, that gives them all purpose in the kingdom. That's a big deal. That, hey, this implies that the king is going to, he's hiring them. He's hiring them. And you're going to work the land. And you bring all the fruit into his house. It may just be for snacks because at mealtime, he's going to be sitting at my table. Just like one of my sons. And I love why he says that he's going to do it. In verse 7, he says, And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake. You know, Jonathan saved David multiple times. And by the way, that wasn't an easy task to do. You go, oh, well, that's easy. He just had to tell him what the king was saying. Remember, the king was Jonathan's daddy. You don't go against the king, and you sure don't go against your daddy. That's a big deal, guys. You understand the level of love and the le level of loyalty that these guys had one to another. And by the way, don't let the perverted world try to pervert that. Hey, there's a bunch of sick, stinking perverts that want to try to make them out to be homosexuals. And that's nothing can be further from the truth. Listen, they just understood what it was like to be a brother from another mother. Do you understand what I'm saying? They understood what it was like to be closer than, than, than as if they were brothers. They were willing to die for one another. It wasn't some kind of filthy, perverted love. It was a brotherly love. And because of that, even though everything that's happened, all the heartache, all the pain, all the, all the tragedy that happened in David's life, David looks and he says, you know what? It's a good day. It's a good day in the kingdom. And he said, Ziba, I want, and, the, and then the Bible even tells us that he says all thy servants are going to be there. And then in verse 10, it even says, now uh, Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. He's got, you know, He's got, what, 35? He's got 35 people working for him now. He went from being, and listen, people were not kind. People were not kind to cripple people back then. People were not kind to handicapped, handicapable, special needs, whatever you want to say. They were not kind to them. They didn't have special words for them. They didn't have special organizations for them. And he said, I'm a dead dog. Those people, a lot of times, they would have to be carried out and set down and begged. You go, yeah, but he was the king's grandson. Yeah, the old king. You mean the king that turned bad? Really? The king that jeopardized his kingdom out of jealousy and hatred? Yeah, that king. He's not king anymore. These guys are nothing unless somebody shows some love. 
You know what, David? David was grateful. David was grateful for what Jonathan did. And he said, I want to show the goodness of God to somebody for Jonathan's sake. That is a response. That's not just something that happened. You know, David didn't say, you know what? Is there anybody from Goliath's family? You know what? Since I, since I busted Goliath in the head and chopped his head off and brought it back to the king, Goliath got any kids around that I could show some kind of... He didn't do that. This is a provoked response out of love and gratitude. He was provoked unto kindness because of love and gratitude. You know, I wonder when the last time we did something to show the kindness of God to somebody because we were provoked unto love out of gratitude. As, as we study it, even in the New Testament and, and we go through and you start looking at uh, the way, the, the prediction of how the world's going to get. They should be lovers of their own selves, unnatural affection. One of the things listed there, it's unholy, unthankful. Disobedient to parents and all, I mean, it goes right down the list. But unthankful is one of those. You know, in life, we were talking just a minute ago when it was time to receive the offering and, and I'm, I made comment about, you know, some people don't like, like it that we receive an offering. Brother Paul said, I, there's givers and there's receivers. And I would always rather be the giver. You know, listen, there's times when somebody needs help and we have to get involved and we help. And it... Listen, sometimes it, it's expensive. It's expensive. When you dig down deep and, and all of a sudden you emptied out your wallet and it's still not enough and then you got to go to your hiding place and, you know, you, you know you're trying to figure out if there's money in the bank or you got to dump out a change jar and start rolling quarters and, you know, you're just trying to help somebody. Sometimes it's expensive. And if we're not careful, we'll allow ourselves to get bitter because it costs a lot. But I promise you, I would always be on the side rolling quarters and trying to dig money from here or there or asking a group of people to pitch in and give than I would to be on the receiving end. I'd rather be on the gathering and giving end than to be on the, on the receiving end. Now, some people, it doesn't bother them. They, I mean, you know, they act like their, their arm is stuck in this position. You know. And I always encourage people, now listen, we, we help, but I do. I'm, I'm, you may have noticed I'm fairly blunt about some things. And uh, so there, there's a lot of times I tell people, I said, hey, you know, they're like, I, I just need some help. I said, you do. I said, you need a helping hand. And ironically, and, and, and boy, you are blessed in this, God stuck one on the end of each of your arms. You need to go get a job. You need to work. You need to work hard. You need to work so hard you can shut your stinking mouth and stop complaining. And then you work hard and you get paid. And you know what? Then you need less help. <laughs> You ought to always exhaust and be exhausted before you ask for help. Amen. You ought to exhaust everything you have. And by the way, you know, don't, don't, and, and this is the season, and this is going to sound critical, but this is the season where people will come and they'll be, you know, it's middle of December, middle of January, and they'll, they'll be talking about how we need help paying for our utilities and this and that. Meanwhile, they stood out in, in the lines and they went through on Black Friday and they, they bought a bunch of stuff they couldn't afford and then they can't pay their utilities. You don't need help. You need some sense. Yeah. And we know folks like that and, and that sounds mean and I know that sounds critical, but listen, if you could fix that ahead of time, if you can't afford something, you know, you, hey, your family may not like it. Write them a love note. During this time of season when we recognize and celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, and we're so thankful for that, and I'm thankful for you, and I love you, and boy, I want to do everything that I can, and, and, uh, and we just love the Lord. And, you know, write somebody a nice card. You don't have to go out and buy somebody expensive, lavish gifts. You really don't. Now, I know the world says you do, and the commercial says you do, and, and those commercials are good, man. We try to let our kids watch TV much at all. But man, if, if let a commercial come on. My four-year-old, he's like, Daddy, 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 I need one of those. I need one of those. I was like, what is that? And it's some kind of bed, you know, fitted bed sheet in the shape of an animal. And it covers up, you know, and I don't even know what they're called. But they, you know, somebody just said something. They know. 
They've seen it because their kids went, Mom, Mom, look, there, there it is. Man, those, hey, they're spending millions of dollars on those commercials on purpose because they suck you in. And then they double the price and then take half off so you'll still pay full price thinking you got a deal. And so we'll go. And so as we, as we look at this situation here, David, because of something that had happened in the past, he was compelled to do something kind, to show the kindness of, of the Lord. Now listen, there's three areas that, that, that you're going to be provoked in if you're doing it right. And, and here's what I say as a believer Maybe it's kindness that somebody in your family's done for you, or maybe it's kindness somebody else did, or maybe you're looking at the day you got saved and you say the Lord has done so much. Because of what Jesus Christ did for me, whatever it is, something should motivate us into action. David was motivated into love, and he was motivated by love. And, and the love that, that David and Jonathan shared, that brotherly love, it compelled him to show more love. And he said, for Jonathan's sake. So think about this. Jonathan is dead. Jonathan is dead and buried. His son, his son, who could not care for himself, is being cared for on the surface by David. But in reality, it was the, the kindness and love of his own father who now is being bestowed upon him. Hey, mama and daddy, you're not going to be around forever. You want folks to treat your kids right? Are you loving on somebody that will love your children? Are you loving on somebody? Are you, are you being that kind of person that, that you would be so loving and loyal and, and, and that brotherly love to somebody that they would desire to take care of somebody who's lacking in your own family? Maybe one of your children or one of your grandchildren. And you say, well, my kids are all doing good. Mephibosheth was doing fine. He was a healthy little kid till the nurse fell on top of him. We all know life changes like that. In just a moment, life changes. Riding an electric wheelchair because of a Friday at work. Getting ready to come up and start vacation Bible school. in a wheelchair riding in a handicap van to get to church looking for a house that can be modified life changes in just a second guys but since he amen the loudest I'll, what, a, what a perfect illustration brother Webb O'Neill is not a stranger to us brother Webb, Webb O'Neill was a dedicated preacher is still a dedicated preacher he was a church bus driver. Not because I begged him to. He volunteered to be the bus driver. Faithful to the nursing home ministry. Him and his wife, faithful to sing in the choir, whether we wanted him to or not. And <laughs> and, and you just do stuff. You know what? When somebody like that goes down, I don't know about you, I just want to help. I just want to help. I just, I want to be there for them. I, I want to show the kindness of the Lord for His own sake. He's not gone, but for His own testimony and because He was here. Because He was a servant. Because He partnered with us in the ministry. Hey, how much more? Listen, He was dedicated and I believe in, in, in rewarding dedication with dedication. It was love that motivated David. It was a sense of loyalty that motivated David. David was loyal. Jonathan was loyal. And David said, I've got to show somebody some love. What? I, hey, somebody knows somebody? They said, Zeba should know somebody. Zeba, art thou Zeba? I'm Zeba. Tell me about it, Zeba. Who can I help? He said, there's one. Wait, listen, it could have been a soldier. Some, it could have been somebody else. It could have been a healthy son that, you know, something else happened to. He said, no, it's, it's Jonathan's son. David said, he's going to become my son. He's going to eat at my table. 
Can you imagine going from being a poor beggar, crippled up where somebody had to carry you and set you down so you could beg for food every day? See, we, we don't understand whenever they... When, in the scriptures, when you get to like Matthew 6, 9 through 13, and it's like, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forget our... Hey, and all of a sudden they're talking about, give us this day our daily bread. Daily bread. We got two loaves of bread at the house. It'll be good for three weeks. We got a refrigerator full of groceries. We got pantries and this. We have a stockpile. We got a, a freezer on one side of the fridge. We got a, we got a decked out flip top, big console preacher, uh, freezer. <laughs> this thing is, is just a big old thing. This thing is as big as a coffin. And, and, and in, the, in there, it's just a, it's big. People, ha our houses are full of food. We're talking about, give us this day our daily bread. What day? You can be praying three months out and not run out of food. <coughs> Freezer's full of fish and dead deers and, and pizza and, I mean, just all kinds of stuff. You know, I mean, there's freezers full of stuff. Mephibosheth, he understood, Lord, give me this day my daily bread. And he had a little baby. He's got a young son. Give us this day, Lord, our daily bread. Anybody help, help, anybody help a poor crippled man? Jingle, 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 jingle. Somebody got a few shekels? Somebody got a little bread? Any help for Mephibosheth? There's no more begging. Give us this day our daily bread. He just picked up 35 servants working fields that he's never had to till. And he's eating it. And guess what? He probably, listen, you have to understand what this came with. He's not wearing beggar's clothes. Beggar's clothes are not appropriate for the king's table. Yeah. He's going to get clothes worthy of sitting at the king's table. He's got servants loading him up with food. By the way, he's going to have more than him and his family could possibly eat. So what do you think is going to happen? All of a sudden, he's had to spend some time as a taker. Now he's going to be a giver. Because of love. You get compelled by love unto love. You get compelled by loyalty unto loyalty. And Jonathan had served David. The king's son had served alongside David. Hey, labor. When somebody does for you, it makes you want to do for somebody. Now there are sorry takers in this world that are just in take mode, take mode, take mode. But at some point, friend, we ought to take that and we ought to be thankful enough and we ought to show enough gratitude and we ought to be compelled by the love that somebody's shown us, the loyalty to, unto God that somebody's shown us and the labor that somebody's bestowed upon us and turn around and use that and labor for others. Amen. David's the king. He's a very busy man. David's not going to have time to go out and till a field. That's not the king's work. David's not going to be able to go out and, and pick fruit out of an orchard. That's not David's lot in life. But David made sure that the labor was going to happen and not the labor of one man. The labor of 35. One day, Mephibosheth wakes up and he's a beggar. The next day, he's royalty. He's wearing garments appropriate to sit before the king. He has 35 working in a massive field. He's sitting at the king's table eating the king's food. Everything changed for him. And he, showed, he didn't say, Oh, king, live forever. It's about time. That time you showed up, I deserve this. He said, what is thy servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I am? And the king just looks at him and goes, anyway, Ziva, here's what we're going to do. I love it when people ignore questions, you know. He's like, he's like, he's like oh, what's with this guy? Anyway, he just goes right on. Crazy humility. Crazy humility. Now, you may not be in the position of a king. I'm certainly not in the position as a king. 
But I know that I have been loved. And there's not many. There's not many in this world. But I have some loyal, loyal friends. And I've had some people help me. And bestow some labor upon me. And that compels me. And even if God hadn't blessed me with human friends that had helped me along the way, my Savior, He loved me. He was loyal, loyal unto death, even the death of the cross. And His labor, His labor of love is not going to be in vain on me. That, that love, that loyalty, that labor compels me and should compel each and every one of us to desire not to be a taker, but to be a giver and to be a doer and to help somebody. Mephibosheth is never going to be able to pay David back. It's just not. You know what that is? That's ministry. You go pick up a bunch of kids on a, on a church bus. I didn't say go down and pick up a bunch of CEOs who might drop a bunch of money in the offering plate. Go pick up a bunch of kids and tell them about Jesus. That's ministry. Go to the other end of the spectrum. Go down here to the, to the nursing home. To the forgotten people of the nursing home. Go down here to the people who many, in many cases, not every case, but in many cases, their family members have dropped them off and left them. Right. We had a woman that was well enough to, to come from the nursing home. She started coming on Sunday afternoons to our church services because of the old news. Fell in love with them and their dedication to be there every week. And started coming to the church services. And she came and she joined the church and she didn't have any money. She didn't have anything. She's not going to teach a Sunday school class. And bless her heart, she tried to put on her makeup and man, she put on a lot of makeup. She had eyebrows that thick, usually way up here. So much blue. She wore lipstick so big that if you didn't know better, you'd almost think she was being sarcastic or just trying to be funny. But she just wanted to look decent coming to church. She got sick and I saw her in the hospital. I went back to see her in the hospital. She's still there. I went back another time and they said she got to go home. Okay. It was right at Christmas time. So I said, okay, I don't have time to go back to the nursing home right now. I'll go see her another day. Went home. It was Christmas. A couple days. Went to the, you know, she's feeling better. So I went back to the nursing home and they said she's, she went back to the hospital. So I, here I am, you know, I'm trying to chase this little old lady around. So I'm over here. I need to see Miss Mildred. I need to see Miss Mildred. Go to the hospital. I need to see Miss Mildred. She's finally, I go back and forth. Like she, she, she went to the nursing home. She went to the hospital. I went to the director at the nursing home. I said, what happened? Where is she? And, and they said, well, because of HIPAA laws, we're not allowed to tell you. I said, where's her family? They said, when she was dropped off, her son said, don't call me when she's sick. You can let me know when she's gone. And a check just comes every month. Nobody ever came to visit her, ever. The nursing homes in Dallas County, the hospitals in Tarrant County, I'm going back and forth. She died. Finally, I just I, I closed the door and I said, look, she's got no family. We're her family. We're her church family. We're all she's got. Where is she? She says she died. She died alone. There was nobody there to hold her hand. 
There was no family circled around her praying. Miss Guelda had just sent a blanket. I carried the blanket up there just trying to get it to her. She wanted her to be warm. Between the HIPAA laws that wouldn't allow us to, to know where she was, the coroner, they didn't know if it was Dallas County, it was there, she got back and forth, and finally in the end, they just cremated her and threw the ashes in a pauper's grave. Nobody. We had a memorial service for her with no ashes, no body. All we had was just love for her. And we just remembered her. What I'm saying is this. We know each other here, but you may not know everything about somebody. And we never imagined. She didn't complain about it. She didn't talk about it. She didn't say, hey, preacher, why don't you pray for my son? He, he hasn't been to see me in two years. And... and, and he didn't know his mama had died until he got a canceled check back. How cold. The only love that lady had was the love that some of our church folk showed her. We look at people and we think, Everything's fine with them. Everything's okay. Hey, friend, you don't know. I don't know. I don't know what kind of pain is behind somebody's eyes. I don't know what kind of heartache. I don't know what kind of tragedy. We don't know. All we, and we don't have to know. What we need to know is that we need to love people. We love people because God loved us. And He showed His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. And He was faithful. He was loyal. And we ought to be faithful and loyal. Right. And He worked. He traveled. They tried to kill Him in place after place after place. He traveled and He taught and He made sure people knew who He was. So, and He called unto Him disciples and sent out from Him apostles. And He made sure that things were going to go so that on the other side of the world we would hear about the love of Jesus Christ. What are you going to do about that love? What will the love of Christ compel you and me to do? as individuals and then corporately as a church, what are we going to do to show the goodness of God for the sake of Jesus Christ? David said, I'm going to find somebody that can't do for themselves and I'm going to do for them. I'm going to take a nobody and make them a somebody. I'm going to take a nothing and make them something. I'm going to take a man who's not worth anything and he's got a little boy that he can't provide for. And I'm going to take him. And I'm going to love him. And I'm going to make them royalty. He's going to be like my son. Guess what? His, hey, Mephibosheth's boy got a new peepaw. He was growing up without his peepaw. David said, I'll be his peepaw. Mephibosheth's going to be my son. Hey, it wasn't cheap. It wasn't easy. But it was within David's means. By the way, nobody expects any of us to be superheroes. But we need to work within our means and do something for somebody because we love the Lord and because it's right and because it's what God wants us to do and because believers before us have set forth a magnificent example of selflessness. That's what God wants us to do. That's what God is pleased with. That's what God expects. That's what God ought to get. Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you so much for loving us first. Lord, we wouldn't even understand the concept of love if you hadn't loved us first. Father, we're in the time of thanksgiving. Help us not to talk about it. 
Help us to live it out in our daily lives. Lord, we love you. Thank you for those who have been givers, those that have invested in us, those who've blazed the pathway of keeping up with right doctrine and loving people and serving you. And help us to follow that example and do even more if we can. Lord, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.